Good afternoon and good evening to all of you, depending on the time zone you happen to be at this global event. A reminder, this webinar will involve a screening of a video and then a panel discussion. And at any time, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask a question for any of the panelists. Uh, the chat box is also enabled, depending on your screen setup. You can also change how the screen looks during the screen options by Zoom. So before I turn it over to Carol Thiessen, our moderator for this event, I want to explain that this film highlights and celebrates our Scaling Up Conservation Agriculture Program, otherwise known as SUCA. By the way, my name is James Cornelson. I am the Public Engagement Manager at Canadian Food Greens Bank. And I want to say thanks to all of you, by the way, who have donated and supported this work. This innovative project is now ending. However, while people can still fund this type of work at the Food Grains Bank, this film is about the next step by which you can support the work. There's a real opportunity and your voice is needed. So there will be an opportunity to use a new online tool that we've developed and send a message. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the webinar. So it's important. So please stay tuned for that and how you can participate. We are going to post a couple of things in the chat box, or at least we're going to try uh, a viewing guide, which uh, we've created that goes alongside this film. Uh, the film is going to be made available and is public now on YouTube. And we will be uh, launching that and asking people to actually host, host screenings of their own. Uh, we're also going to, just in case technology fails us, which it sometimes does, uh, we're going to post a link to that YouTube um, video version of this film in the chat box and if needed, fingers crossed, uh, you'll have you can go watch it there but everything should work fine I'm sure. And so now we are going to launch a little quiz. Uh, you'll should see that on your screen. So please go ahead and click on it to give your answers. It's anonymous so don't feel shy. And hopefully you can see that now. So there's also a poll question on who's watching today. So you should see it on your screen. And uh, a couple of related questions that are related to our content today. So I'm going to introduce, while you're doing that, I'm going to introduce Carol Thiessen as moderator. Um, Carol Thiessen is our Senior Policy Advisor at Canadian Food Grains Bank and leads our campaign team to advocate for increased Canadian investments in agriculture development. She is based in Winnipeg, and that's where I'm based as well, and we're broadcasting here from Treaty 1 in Winnipeg. She's also directly involved in producing this film. So I am going to turn it over to you, Carol. You have the floor. Thank you very much, James, and I'm so glad for all of you who are taking time out on your weekend um, to come and watch this film with us and talk to us about it. So um, really glad to have you here. Um, we often hear the question from, from supporters and other Canadians, does Canadian aid matter? What impact does it have? Is it just wasted money? Does it have any long lasting impact? Um, and we're here to demonstrate through this film that Canada's support overseas does matter. It makes a difference it has long lasting impact. And we're gonna do that through telling the story of one woman and her community. We're also here in honor of International Women's Day, which is on Monday. Um, and part of the reason we do that is to highlight the incredible contribution that women bring to ending global hunger in their homes and in their communities. Women face lots of barriers globally, but they are also agents of change and they are transforming their lives with just a little outside support. I'm not gonna say more because we will have a panel of experts after the film to do so. Um, but for now, let me just introduce them and then we'll watch our short film. So Florence Nduku is the monitoring and evaluation coordination coordinator of the Scaling Up Conservation Air Culture Program with us at the Canadian Food Grains Bank. And she is based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, so welcome Florence. And Anya Asurin is the program manager for East Africa and South Asia for Tier Fund Canada and has been very involved in this project. And she is also based in Kenya. So 
Uh, thank you also, Anya, for joining us. And if you want longer bios, we've put the, those in the chat box as well. Um, so the film is about seven minutes long. We're going to watch it now, and then we'll come back and have a panel discussion and opportunities for you to participate in that as well. So James, I'll let you hit roll. All right. That was a seven minute visit to Asnaketch Zima's farm. I hope that the technology worked for everybody and that you were able to see it. Um, lots of captions to read. So of course, um, if you wanna watch it again, um, there will be uh, opportunities for you to be able to watch the film uh, again at home, at home while you're at home now, but again, um, in, in coming days and weeks, if you'd like to. And of course, now we can also talk a little bit more about some of the things that um, we just sort of highlighted in those in those seven minutes. Um, and so I'm going to ask a couple of questions initially to our panelists, and then um, uh, we'll open it up to a Q and A. Um, your your job is to type your questions into the Q and A chat function at the bottom of your screen, um, and then we can uh, take those questions and ask them to our panelists. So um, you can start doing that now already as as we um, start our conversation. Uh, and I'm going to ask the first question to you, Anya. Uh, this film tells the story of one woman, Asna Ketch Zima, who has grabbed onto some training opportunities and has transformed her life uh, and the life of her family. But this is not just one woman's story. Uh, this is the story of community-wide change. Can you just tell us a little bit about the impacts of the Scaling Up Conservation Agriculture Project on food security and on livelihoods? Uh, in her community. Thank you so much, Carol, and a warm welcome to everyone here. Uh, Asna Ketch is from Southern Ethiopia, where Tier Fund's um, church-based partner, TDA, works with over 10,000 farmers. 31% um, of those farmers are in fact women like Asna Ketch. And in the whole of Ethiopia, through all of Canadian Food Grains Bank's other partners through the Mennonite Central Committee, there are a total of 28,000 farmers now practicing conservation agriculture, again, 32% of whom are women. And as a result of this conservation agriculture, which is also coupled with savings, as you saw in the film, and also coupled with marketing strategies, 95% of these farming families now have food 12 months of the year. And significantly for women like Asna Ketch, 83% um, of the women involved in these farming families now have also nutritional diets that are healthful for healthful living. And this is so significant because traditionally they wouldn't make decisions about how money is spent or even what food to bring into the home. And so the improved diets um, are very significant for family life. Now also very significantly is that about 26% of the farmers had been on a safety net program, which is an Ethiopian government program that provides a little money for very destitute um, families. And 30% of those families we're able to get off of that program because of conservation agriculture uh, and through this program. And Asna Ketch uh, household was one of them. And do you remember the woman in white? She's called uh, Felakesh. She um, was the tall lady and she was introduced to conservation agriculture by her pastor and she transformed her soil and you know they call it soil fattening. I love that term. Um, she transformed her soil so significantly that she was able to grow taro. You saw the big root that uh, was pulled out of the soil. And as a result of that, um, she is now able to take her two daughters to college and pay for that because taro sells for 10 times the amount that um, corn does. And uh, the other thing she did, like many other farmers, is she, she um, inspired another 100 farmers to also take up conservation agriculture. She's an amazing um, um, testimony amongst many of farmers. And uh, you know what she says? She says, now I also take food to my pastor because, well, somebody needs to feed him. And he introduced me to the program. 
and she and she says with the confidence of a woman who has gone through many struggles she says i am now a respected leader in my community and i i am a woman thank you thank you anya that's uh really exciting to hear uh, I want to ask a sort of similar question to you, Florence. Um, so Florence, one of Florence's role is really to 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 count and measure change, um, and and so the impacts that we've seen in this community, as as Nikitch notes, go beyond increased household food security. And I think Anya was just starting to touch on it. But as you see her in the film, she talks about this change in her relationship with her her husband, who did not trust her and her you know, going into this program initially. Um, and and, and she, she speaks to it and he speaks to the change in their relationship. Can you tell us, Florence, a little bit more about the change in gender equality in women's empowerment in Aznikech's community, but also across this program? Thank you, Caro. And it's good to be here. Yes, I will want to say that I would identify with ASNECACH, not just for Ethiopia, but also for East Africa, because this program was, was being done in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania as well. And most of the women, uh, as we started the program, um, I, I'll be confident to say from the baseline, we had only less than 18% uh, percent of women that had some knowledge on farming. And ASNECACH represents the uh, more than 50% of the women that we had by the end of the program that were trained. So this program was able to reach out to more women through capacity building. Initially, training was being uh, offered to men because, of course, men being the uh, um, or the owners of the homes, they were more available to attend trainings. But the challenge that was happening is once the training is being done to men, but the farming activities, the people that go to the farm are the women. So that would mean that women would still continue farming without any knowledge, without trainings, because the knowledge was with men. But when this program came, there was a deliberate effort to target women because they are the producers, so can they get the knowledge as well. And that has, that has really made uh, the, the training very impactful. Uh, and from what we have been able to see through the SUCA program, we have seen a lot of changes in terms of food security status, where uh, by the time that we started this program, we only had uh, around 12% uh, of farmers had 12 months of food security in their households. By the time we were ending the program, 71% of the farmers that we worked with had 12 months of food security in their households. Uh, when we started the program, 61% of the farmers were using coping strategies, and more so the women were using uh, more of coping strategies. They would borrow food, they would buy food on credit, they would skip days without food or skip a meal. But at the time the program was ending, only 19% were using a coping strategy. That means that CA was able to change their food availability. Uh, by the time this program was starting, uh, Ethiopia included in the, in the three countries, we only had um, um, food secure households were only 44%. The people that would say they have food all year round and nutritious food, but by the time we were ending the program, these had changed to around 98% of the farmers at uh, food secure households, or they could uh, say, talk of food security. And then, of course, on issues of women uh, making decisions, when the program was starting, it was interesting because men were the ones that were making decisions about the households, what to plant, where to plant, how to use the money. So almost, just like almost 2% of the men consulted their wives. But by the time we were ending the program, interestingly, 85% of men and women confirmed that there's a lot of joint conversations. And I think you could see why Asnekas and the husband agreed to help the wife. And that has, that has been a very common practice in the program where the women would start because of course women want new ideas because it affects, lack of food affects households more and more women are more affected. So when the idea of improving food through conservation agriculture came in, women were more attracted and they were able to convince the husband. So Asnekach is not the only one who was able to convince the husband, but more than 85% of the women were able to convince the husbands to be able to embrace CA. And that has changed um, how families work. Women are now helping the husbands to create wealth in their households. 
uh, by being members of the group of groups as, as Nekat just pointed out, and they're able to borrow money, buy assets and increase assets for their household. So this program has really empowered women uh, both uh, capacity-wise in terms of knowledge and also economically for them to be able to have a say in the households and also to take part in decision making and also attract men to support them in doing the households, household works. Thank you very much, Carol. Thanks, Florence. There is a lot of information there. Um, I think, you know, the big major point that Florence was making was that women had almost no say in the decisions made about their farms, about their way income was used in their households, and now almost all of them were making decisions, were making decisions together with their husbands, and as Florence said, are wealth creators in their homes. Um, I want to follow up, Florence, because another thing that uh, women, I think, experience worldwide and also in this community is just a really um, heavy load, workload, whether that's paid work, work on the farm, but also unpaid caregiving, like taking care of children, taking care of sick relatives, all of those tasks that often fall on the shoulders of women. And I'm, I want to know how has, I mean, you know, we're adding in some ways they're, they're far, the women are also doing farming and they're now they're going to trainings, you know, are, is the workload just getting higher and higher or are, are we also seeing positive changes in, in workload for, for women? And I'm going to ask you to slow down just a little bit because your internet isn't hundred percent great. So slow down a little and, we'll, and, and I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Caro. And sorry for that. Um, great. So with what we have had and, and experience that we have seen from conservation and culture in the last five years, one of the things that CA was, our farming was seen from uh, the beginning was there's a lot of work in farming and mostly women are the ones that were involved in farming, as I said before because they were the ones doing the land preparation, they'll do the weeding, they'll do the harvesting and a lot of work that they do besides the household chores that they do. But when this program came in, there was aspects of um, trying to minimize the number of uh, tillage or uh, making planting stations in your farms for one to be able to plant. So that would mean you didn't have to dig every now and then you just make uh, reaping lines and planting stations. And 60% of the farmers that we worked with, and especially women reported that CA had reduced their labor uh, in farming. The reason was because they didn't have to till the land many times. In Ethiopia, they would till like 70 times for them to plant a crop. But when CA came in, they would only till once or twice for a crop to be grown. So that would mean there's a lot of reduced time in number of tillages that they are doing. And also because CA uses an aspect of soil cover using mulch or other foreign materials where you cover the soil, then that would mean then less weeds were growing in your farm. So there's reduced weeding. And so 89% of farmers said they had used less time to weed their farms. And because also there were trainings around, so how do you manage the weeds when they are young so that they don't multiply a lot. So there was also reduced weeding uh, time for most of the farmers. And of course there were more women friendly tools with conservation agriculture coming in. One of them was the use of handholds uh, instead of uh, using all the machinery every time. So the use of handholds made that women could be able to do farming without necessarily having to wait for their husbands to come and go to the farm. So that would mean they could use the available tools that they had and prepare their land stations and, and also uh, prepare their planting stations and also plant in good time. We had threshing machines that came in because of increased production. So that would mean now women are not just threshing their, their, their food through using their hands, but they use machinery and that really lighten their work. And there are also other, uh, um, other innovations by farmers where they provided scrapers that were used for weeding and the scrapers were friendly even for men to use. And so that brought in men to also help women in weeding. So that meant there's division of labor now. Women, women were not just the only ones weeding, but husbands and boys and girls were also helping. And so more people are getting involved in CA and that meant uh, there's reduced uh, time and they have more time uh, for other activities. When we talk to the women, 
during the end of the program evaluation, one of the interesting things that came was that uh, women were able to save that time and make it and make use of it to attend to domestic uh, other activities, including uh, village groups or social events. And 86% of the farmers said they saved a lot of time and they were able to use that time for other domestic activities. They would uh, take care of the households better. They would prepare more nutritious food because they had more time uh, for their households. Thanks, Tara, I'll stop at that. And if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, I think um, there might be some uh, questions that are already being answered in, in the chat box, but I'm also going to um, I'm going to also ask some of those those questions. And one of the questions I think um, is a question that maybe is good for you, Anya, and possibly Florence as well, is around experimentation. Um, you know, are, are farmers being encouraged? Is, is this top down? We're just teaching. Uh, you know. The, the, the program staff and, and the local partner or, you know, are farmers also being encouraged to experiment and try things on their own and, and learn from each other? Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Norman, for the question. Um, farmers are definitely encouraged to experiment. And so one of the models uh, that we use is what we call farmer field schools. And often what happens is uh, the farmers in a particular locale will choose an area. It could be say a piece of land next to a church uh, or a farmer's piece of land uh, that, a, that the community is comfortable with where they begin to experiment with all kinds of uh, conservation agriculture techniques. But it isn't just left alone at um, uh, a demonstration plot but also the farmers then experiment in their, in their homes and so at the very beginning of the program, many farmers would um, experiment with just a 20 by 20 meter plot. But many of these farmers have expanded that to uh, an acre and beyond. Um, in, uh, in, and in Southern Ethiopia, farmers have about an average of one to 1.2 hectares. So they continue to expand based on, um, on what they were seeing on their experimentation plots. Interestingly, what some farmers do, like um, uh, Fela Kesha, whom you saw later in the video, she keeps deliberately a piece of conventional farming on her land, just so that she can show other farmers uh, the comparison of the quote unquote old way of farming and conservation agriculture farming, which you know is now expanding. All right, and I, I'm going to go right back to you, Anya, with a question that I think you already answered to some degree about about Felakesh and how 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 many people she sort of brought into the to conservation farming. But I will, you know, it, 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 to what degree are farmers sharing their ideas and technologies with others in the in their communities, and and so how how much wider might this actually be spreading than just the people who are part of the project initially? Well, it's amazing how how people have shared. Um, in, in Southern Ethiopia alone, 803 farmers um, um, became conservation agriculture farmers just because people reached out and taught their neighbors. Uh, Felakesh is on the very strong end, you know, training 100, and uh, you'll have some farmers who will reach out to three or four neighbors, but invariably most farmers um, will reach out and um, um, talk to their neighbors because it's just so inspiring, the kind of results that they're seeing, especially after the three-year mark of conservation agriculture. Sorry, I did the, the mute unmute thing there for a second. Um, we have a few more questions coming in here. Um, this is a question I think, uh, you know, I'll ask you, Florence, in, in the video, the women were talking about their, their self-help groups and how they had been borrowing at really extortionate interest rates in the past, and now they're able to use this, this, this self-help group to do so. Can you talk a little bit about what the self-help group does and, uh, and, and how that has benefited the women in the community? Thank you, Carol. So, 
a survey group, I'll put it in the uh, in the African context, also in the which is also the Ethiopian context. So a survey group is um, say a number of small older farmers, especially neighbors, people from within the same locality, within the same vicinity, with with common problems, common um, practices that they do together, that come together so that they can be able to assist each other. So most of the several groups are registered uh, in their countries or registered locally, or some are just uh, um, unregistered, just like mutual understanding. And basically people would come together to help each other in farming activities, Mostly uh, people would use the server groups to conduct trainings because it would be easier for you to reach out to more people in a, an organized setup. So partners or organization would use such setups to offer extension services to the farmers. The farmers would also use those forums to maybe to respond to their needs, maybe their financial issues. So they support one another to contribute small amounts of money on a monthly basis or on need basis to support each other to undertake their programs and several groups are very common practice in Africa actually because they they it's like if there's the power of unity people believe in when we are together we can do a lot not when I'm alone I can't do much but together we can do a lot and that has really been a great movement in in Africa to have people coming together in several groups to do great things uh, together including the, the, the formation of saving groups, the village saving groups is actually born from the server groups. So now people are able now to save money together. They can borrow that money at small interest rates and people are able to invest in small micro businesses, buy livestock or uh, other uh, kind of activities, including when marketing their products together. So there's power in unity. That is what uh, farmers are backing on to use the server groups. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Florence. Um, there's another question that is asking about whether there is good cooperation with, with local government and the government of Ethiopia and related agencies like the Agriculture Department and others. I'm not sure if this is a good question for Anya or Florence. Who, which one of you would like to draw, jump in and talk about sort of the relationship with, with the, in this case, Ethiopian government or other governments and, 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 and field staff and that sort of thing? Maybe I'll take that up, Carol, first, and okay. maybe Anya can add. Great. So one of the things that happened in Ethiopia is uh, Ethiopia actually have, has a lot of support uh, because um, Ethiopia uses an approach where farmers are used to provide services to the other farmers. So they use one farmer to five farmer model. So one farmer is recognized by the government, provided with training, and then they provide the training to the other farmers. So it's one model farmer to five farmers. So one farmer models five farmers. And so the government of the OPR has been very keen to support those initiatives. And when conservation and culture came in, it was one of the other, one, another approach that also used the same model that the Ethiopian government was using. And so the Ethiopian government really took up um, these extension models and also the conservation and practice as a, as a very important tool that would help farmers to fight the food insecurity status in Ethiopia. And so the government of Ethiopia already enshrined or accepted CA to be used as an extension model in the extension model by the Ethiopian government. So the Ethiopian government, including the prime minister actually are the key, they're really champions of farming in Ethiopia and they really support partners in, in, in programming, especially on the conservation agriculture program. So maybe I'll stop there. If there are any additions, maybe Anya, you can add. Yes, thank you, Florence. I think that's quite comprehensive. The other thing about the Ethiopian government is that they have a climate smart agriculture strategy and they have put conservation agriculture as a result of the lobbying done by Canadian Food Brains Bank and its members and partners in Ethiopia and through some very specifically targeted events in the country, um, they have now placed conservation agriculture front and center uh, of this climate smart um, agriculture strategy. In addition, the um, Canadian Food Grains Bank partners uh, through the members are now seen as experts in conservation agriculture. And in fact, the extension workers of the Ministry of Agriculture are many times being trained by uh, our local partners like um, 
like TDA um, and the Mennonite Central Committee partners on request of the government. So, and it's a huge transformation from, as you heard, plowing a field per season up to 10 times to, you know, minimum tillage and the other things. So um, the expertise has been noted both at a policy level and also at a training level. All right, thank you, Anya. And you just touched on something that I'm going to follow up with on you and that's around climate change. We have Joanne asking, how significant is climate change in farmers that you are working with? And I think, um, uh, so let's talk specifically about, about Ethiopia and, and the area where Asnikot catches farming. And I think we can also talk about why conservation agriculture is a good response to, to the impacts of, of climate change. And I will say, I think we have lots of questions now coming in and we're running out of time. So this will be our last question and then we'll segue to the next part. But Anya, over to you. Yes, um, climate change uh, is definitely uh, something that the farmers are dealing with. One of the examples in Southern Ethiopia where um, Asna Ketch lives, is of that a uh, crop you saw, the taro. Taro is something that women like Asnaketch and Felakesha used to eat and grow when they were little girls in their villages. But because of changes in climate and because of the um, changes in soil, especially drying out of soil and lack of nutrition in the soil, that taro root could no longer be uh, grown. It is such a valuable crop because one, it can stay stored in the soil. So you take it out when you need it. Um, and two, it's also very valuable on the market. And so the soils, the, 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 big sorry, the big contribution of something like conservation agriculture that after a few years of fattening the soil, if you will, um, you can grow uh, a, a greater variety of crops and especially the traditional crops that used to be um, so common um, to these communities can now come back and they tend to have um, good nutritional value um, and apparently now also have very good marketing value as well. Okay, thank you, Anya. And thank you so much uh, to Florence as well, both for both of you giving up your Saturday evening in Nairobi and sharing with us about the transformational change that is happening in Asna Kitch's life and in her community. As we said at the beginning, this isn't just a story about a one woman farmer or one community or even one country. This is also the story of the important role the Canadian government does play, play in supporting change. They help fund the project as Nakech was part of, and they fund many agricultural projects and programs around the world. Uh, at the beginning, James introduced me as, as a pub public policy advisor, and you may have wondered what that means. Um, my role is to try to encourage and advocate to the Can Canadian government to do more to end global hunger. We know it's a really important part of of, 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 of an answer to the problem of global food insecurity and hunger around the world. And we know that supporting agriculture is a really important part of that solution. The majority of people who experience poverty, who experience regular food insecurity, live in rural areas and depend on agriculture. We also know that after decades of progress, hunger is on the rise again and has been in the last few years. And that's because of climate change. That's because of conflict. It's because of economic challenges that many countries have experienced. And now because of the pandemic and responses to the pandemic in many countries. Yet we're not seeing Canada's aid for agriculture rising in the, need that, in the way that is needed. A graph on the viewing guide that I thought you were going to have, but you will have to receive later, um, which shows you sort of the the current trajectories of hunger rising, agricultural support declining from the Canadian government. Although we do hope that some of that is changing um, because of, of, of activities to try to respond to, to the pandemic, but um, we need to see much more support. So after seeing this film and hearing our panelists, and you, if you're wondering what more you can do um, one of the things that you can do is to use your voices to support an increase in aid for agriculture. And so I'm going to hand over to James now, who will tell you a little bit more about how you can do this. Uh, 
Thanks, Carol. Thanks so much to Carol and also to Florence and Anya. You've done a great job of answering questions. And speaking of which, there was a question about whether this would be a this recording would be available on our website. And I know we will certainly be sharing a recording of this. I know on our Facebook page. So if you follow us on the Facebook page, you can see this. And uh, that's probably the easiest way to do that. Uh, and also speaking of questions, I see Florence and Anya are busy answering other questions in the Q&A. So with a few minutes remaining, if you still have a question, you can push them to the limit and see, see what they can all answer in a short amount of time. Uh, but thanks again to Florence and Anya for joining us. It's been great. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us. So over to you, audience, uh, to respond. We have, uh, as Carol said, created opportunities for people to use their voice. And there is a clear opportunity uh, for us to do that now and a reason to do that now. So we created an online tool to send a personal message to your MP to show that you care about Canada's response to global hunger. And what you've seen today is an example of how that, that response can be very effective. In other words, we talk a lot about agriculture development, but as you saw from the film, this is about uh, parents feeding their families, education, health, all kinds of things. So there's so many benefits from that kind of support. So we are asking people to use their voice. Canada could champion this type of support uh, even beyond what the Food Grains Bank does. As a wealthy country, we can and we should do so much more. Uh, but we still hear people say, even in government, that Canadians don't care enough for us to do more, which is why writing a message to your MP is so important. So we're gonna put a link into the chat box. Uh, Megan's going to be putting that link in and it is the, oh, I see it's there already. There's the foodgreensbank.ca slash online letter. It's a personal letter builder. But what we have heard is that the kind of communication that makes a difference is as personal as possible. But of course in pandemic world, we can't get to church basements or school classrooms or other types of groups to do this in person and write personal letters. So we still have to adapt. And so that letter builder is for you to be able to create a letter that's very much personal, that's sent to your MP as an attachment that they will print out and that they will uh, pass on to the member of, the, uh, member of parliament. This, uh, hopefully it will, it will also be copied and sent to the Minister of International Development, but it's so important for your MP to actually voice that message either to their party leader or in their caucus or their colleagues. Uh, so please uh, do that. And also, as we mentioned earlier, if you're interested in sharing this with um, friends and neighbors or your community in some way, um, get in touch with us. So we are going to um, add a poll. We're gonna launch a poll uh, that actually asks whether you might be interested in doing and hosting a screening of your own with your church or your community or something like that with a few other questions there. So again, we wanna say thank you for your support and uh, thank you for your voice uh, for using those tools. And uh, yeah, don't forget to fill that quiz out. And thank you again so much for joining us on this Saturday. Um, we uh, will follow up with any of you who decide you want to do something more like a screening or, or hosting a letter writing of your own. So thanks again, everyone, and we will see you again soon.